My name is Derek Wall, and I'm the manager of adult and university programs here at the Utah Museum of Fine Arts. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the UMFA, and um, thank you for being here this evening. Before we begin this special event, I would just like to acknowledge that the UMFA is situated on land which is named for the Ute tribe and is the unceded traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah and the Utah Museum of Fine Arts acknowledge the significance of place and the continued existence and contributions of indigenous people who have lived on and cared for this land for thousands of years. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's and UMFA's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. <clears throat> so, we're very thrilled to have you join us tonight for ACME session, Day Without Art 2023. Every year since 1989, on or around World AIDS Day, December 1st, art museums close their doors, turn off their lights, or shroud works of art. This international day of action and mourning is in response to the AIDS crisis, and it is called Day Without Art. It honors individual legacies, commemorates personal loss, and increases awareness and action to combat the worldwide AIDS epidemic, worldwide AIDS epidemic, which has not gone away. Each year since 2014, Visual AIDS has commissioned and distributed a video program for Day Without Art, coordinating screenings at over 100 venues around the world. The Utah Museum of Fine Arts is proud to be one of those venues. Tonight, in partnership with Visual AIDS, we are proud to present Everyone I Know is Sick, a collection of five videos generating connections between HIV and other forms of illness and disability. Um, I just want to note that Visual AIDS is the only contemporary arts organization that is fully committed to raising AIDS awareness and creating dialogue around HIV issues today by producing and presenting visual art projects, exhibitions, public forums, and publications while assisting artists living with HIV and AIDS. It is a great honor to provide a space for this important, meaningful, and insightful work. I would also like to thank the following organizations that have made our event tonight possible. Visual AIDS, the University of Utah Honors College, the University of Utah History Department, Hope on Tap, UAF Legacy Health, and our sponsor, ZAP, Zoo Arts and Parks. So at the conclusion of the film, we will do a quick uh, set change up here, and then we will have a panel discussion. Um, and that will go for about 30 minutes, and then we will follow that up with a brief Q&A. And I think we're all ready to go. So please enjoy the shorts, and you'll see me in a little bit. Thank you.
Sign of the stairs. I lived on the third floor at the time. I couldn't go up more than four or five steps before I had to rest. In that moment, my cat fell off from my head. I looked up and saw my head. It can be made an old man. to my forefathers and the steps of the ceremonial town.
y no lo sé nada. Y yo no soy nada. Lo que me rodea es todo. Y juntos somos uno. morir para ser uno con lo que me rodea
because um, I know <laughs> I know a kind of gentle expression. For me, for me, for some time, this is like that is it all, man. Don't think so. Ah, when you know what? Don't think so. Okay, I'm going to do that. But I'm going to do that. 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 I'm going to do that.
Imagine having to sit in prosthetics to read and being able to see only one word at a time. Imagine having to inject yourself with AIDS medication 
the streets in for irritating lines. Twice a day, twice a day, in action is me, swallowing lights in my right skin. Imagine having to savor in chaos stations all over your face and body. Imagine being discriminated against by hateful, bigoted, religious men of the sea. Um, when I think of all that hateful bigotry against people with AIDS and the Ukraine, it made me lose my faith in pain and afraid. Losing your friends to AIDS, who have experienced painful, terrifying deaths. It is not okay that my friends die terrible, painful deaths and that they die way before their time. What a shame, what a terrible thing. The most talented and creative people gone, gone, gone way before their time. One of my friends asked me how I survived AIDS. My limited visual acuity permits me to see the world like an impressionist painting. The resulting disability left me believing I would never have a partner to share my life. Fortunately, I met Terry, who also has HIV. He is a caring, loving, a committed partner. He will forever hold my heart. I'm Jill. I'm the Swan. Imagine having to struggle with adaptive computer technology just to do your work. My blind vision series of self-portraits has become my most iconic body of work. For me, they are a painful reminder of what AIDS has done to my sight. It is not apt to be born. Nor can his youth prepare his better to give him life. In every respect, he is a victim of his environment, a child of circumstances over which he has no control. And if each of his transgressions were impartially investigated, it would be found that in nine out of ten cases, he was born to a judge rather than a sinner.
todas as pessoas que conheci, se contasse que eu vi, foram enganadas, mentiras, testadas, sofridas, esterilizadas, enlouquecidas, dedicadas, criminalizadas, envenenadas, manipuladas, silenciadas, abandonadas, esquecidas. Todas as pessoas que conheci, sem contar que a mim, foram feitas de peças, um jogo, manejadas a meu prazer do sistema, que leva tudo de nós como quiser, da forma que quiser, que me leva, me leva, a gente se vê seguindo suas regras, a tentativa de esquivar, de sermos trocados por uma mentira do inverno, para fugir do caminhão, da fome, do medo. Mas ele continua. Ele o leva, ele o leva e ele o levou. Todas as pessoas que conheci, nem vou contar das que amei, foram assassinadas pela AIDS. Nesse jogo, o sistema fortaleceu uma farmacêutica que veio a cura ao mundo para quem ela já não significava mais nada. Talvez 
Jesus was showing a woman sitting at his feet. Não era preciso de dor, mas ai dos sonhos ossos, a memória dos beijos, dos sonhos, dos rins e dos futuros. Ai de sala da cabeça do Jesus, mãos, carregada no campo da cena automática da Secretaria de Segurança Pública, mirada na cara de pressão, com o dedo do banco mundial para a tigre, enquanto o império ri e toma nossos corpos negros como petróleo. A vida tem sido tão somente subordinada e governadora. A Venezuela no Nepal, o tempo está acabando para as crianças e suas mortes. Ontem, ela descreveu. Amor é superação. E as ações do mundo são sempre no desejo que vão morrer. E provavelmente amanhã haverá milhares de homenagens para a minha importância. Mas essa vida, ninguém se importa se eu não sofrer. Este corpo, tirado do ML, raras vezes desidratado. Campanha, tecnologia, faz o outro sobrevivente. Este, por sua vez, não é o que permanece vivo. Temos que parar bem de ser obrigatoriamente importados. Os sobreviventes mantêm-se com a carga viral detectável e transmissível. Em fase de jogo avançar, ela descartou o leite que escorria de seus seios como lágrimas. Amor e a ZT não se tomam com ilusões. Foi em alguma manhã que a minha avó sonhou com a minha velhice. Contaram-me em sussurros. Sua mãe foi até em Tatsirica buscar sementes. Plantou a fura, no seu peito. Em algum momento, a fura será. Curti ver meus olhos no saber de serena. Estou constantemente me lembrando que me esquecer. Insisto em futuros possíveis. Igual meu pai, que construía casas, tijolo por tijolo. E meu fígado ecoa o grito dos meus ancestrais, caluga e balou os estrelos. Sabia que sou água? Dessas que se toma com a certeza. Quando minha mãe morreu, chovia. Ela segurou a mão da minha outra mãe, prometeram ser eternas. Não tiveram tempo de chorar, por isso tenho tanta água em mim. Contorno, argeio, refresco, mas também há lá fronteiras, a flor de saudades. Decifrei como a raiz se desenvolve, faz cópias de mim mesmo. Aproveita as cadrechas, as lacunas, o silêncio, chá de raiz, fortalece o ser monológico. Sou me envolvei numa agenda de amor, organizar arquivos e imaginar a memória. Desaprender o que claramente é resistência, abdicar-me da necessidade de expansão, celebrar a sacralidade da minha beleza e fazer as fases com a morte, respirar a singularidade e permitir resistir à convocação extrema da vida. Eu sou verdadeiramente uma gota de sol sobre a terra. Minha voz sonhou com a minha beleza. A cura já foi colonizada entre nós. Eu queria dar muito, mano, tipo, lá na sua colação de grau, tá ligado? Mas eu vou estar aqui do outro lado. Mas, mano, a gente tá longe, né, mano? Tipo, a vida botou a gente bem longe geograficamente, mas eu, mano, lembro de você todo dia, obviamente. E peço as suas naturas pra todo dia cuidar de você, viu? Mas parar de uma caminhada aí. Que a gente, mano, sabe da nossa história. E a gente sabe pra onde a gente vai, viu, mano? A gente não é mais só sobrevivência, tá ligado? A gente sobreviveu, mas a gente está construindo a nossa vida também. 
eles menos de embalagem, mano. Nossos pais são aliviados, tá ligado? To invite our panelists to join us on stage, and we'll make some introductions. Our moderator for this evening is Jim Solomon, Program Manager and Faculty at the University of Utah Honors College. Dr. Solomon's interests include contemporary art, duration, gender studies, queer theory, visual culture, subcultures, and alternative forms of politics. And they are joined tonight by our fabulous panelists, um, Emmer Afros, CEO of UAF Legacy Health, formerly the Utah AIDS Foundation, Elizabeth Alice Clement, Associate Professor of History, Eileen H. Clyde, Professor of History, and the Director of Graduate Studies for the University of Utah History Department, and Sekwon Kolevas, Founding Partner and Executive Director of Hope on Tap, a local nonprofit that provides mobile harm reduction services, testing, treatment, and peer-led prevention to vulnerable and medically underserved communities across the state of Utah. Please join me in welcoming everyone on stage. So I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Solomon. And yeah, have fun. Thank you. I will say, um, most of the time people call me Virginia. I only insist on Dr. Solomon when someone tries to like miss or Mrs. Solomon me or something yeah. like that. And it's like, for all of the ways that you're wrong, we're using this honor right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just wanted to um, open um, with talking a little bit about you know, visual aids as an organization um, and the particularities of this program. I know you all had a walking 
tour of some pieces in the gallery before the video screening, um, one of which was blacked out for the celebration of the day without art. But you all might notice in the programming that there is some um, exceptionally obnoxious postmodern grammar play where it's with and out is in parentheses. So um, visual aids will talk about this as day sort of like with art and without art. Um, day without art was started as a way to acknowledge the kind of disproportionate impact of HIV and AIDS on the arts community. Um, and the gesture of blocking out an artwork or closing museums entirely, kind of demonstrating that impact, what society would lose um, with the loss of the communities that at that moment were disproportionately affected and certainly um, stigmatized within the context of the AIDS, the AIDS crisis. Um, but what artists kind of started to realize is that repeated a lot of the kind of critiques that AIDS activists were presenting against the dominant cultural response to HIV and AIDS in the first place, which was about trying to sort of garner pity um, by presenting people with AIDS as humans, but as victims and things like that. Sort of there's a way in which it was robbed that, that version of politics robbed people of agency. And by covering up art, it robbed art of its agency. And so what um, visual aids started to do was to do the stay with art as well. So things like this video program demonstrating the efficacy that art can have within the context of the AIDS crisis um, and kind of along the lines of what my research area is with politics more, more broadly. So um, right, we kind of have this history of how AIDS activist art shows an overlap between art and questions of kind of health and public policy. And so I'm actually, I'm like elated at the constitution of this panel because I think that there's some really kind of cool ways that we, we can, can speak to that and speak to those overlaps, speak to ways um, that as much as Grand Fury made a claim in the uh, poster that they made for the winter 1988-1989 season um, of programming at the kitchen, which is an artist run sort of space in theater in New York. They said with 42,000 dead, art is not enough. I think part of what this gives us an opportunity to think of is that art might not be the sole answer, but art is part of an answer. Um, so uh, I'm a contemporary art historian. I've learned that when you're in Utah, I can't say I'm a contemporary Western art historian because people then think I'm like working on art about cowboys. <laughs> but you know, so Western Europe and the uh, Western Western Hemisphere. Uh, but my work very much focuses on sort of uh, queer art and the way that queer art thinks about different ways of conceptualizing what politics is more than just like governmentality and public policy and stuff like that. And so um, AIDS activist art is very much a part of, of my research program in that regard. And I'd love to kind of invite the rest of the panelists to talk about your, um, your work, your affiliation with um, sort of ongoing issues related to HIV and AIDS and anything else that you think might be a good extended intro. Great. Um, I don't mind starting. Um, so UAF Legacy Health um, used to be Utah AIDS Foundation. So we were founded in 1985 um, after essentially the local government refused to do anything about HIV. So at that time, there were 13 cases um, and quickly, obviously, evolving. Um, so UAF formed uh, around a kitchen table. Um, and so now, here we are, over 40 years later, um, have broadened our scope um, because of the kind of intersectionality of, of HIV, who it impacts, and the early movement of who is really helping to actually do things and help people um, have broadened our scope to larger LGBT primary care, as well as being a center for um, HIV expertise in terms of medical care. Um, so we really started largely as um, a supportive services agency um, and in the very beginning, largely dealing with end of life care um, and now have transitioned um, to really helping people thrive in all aspects of their health um, and the many different meanings of what health is to someone. Um, and so that's kind of the, the transition and the, the growth of UAF, um, again, to try and fill a gap. Um, Utah is one of the only states that doesn't have an LGBT specific community health center um, and a community health center that doesn't um, focus on HIV and sexual health care. Um, so UAF is, is happy to have just opened and started seeing patients to be the first in Utah to do so. Yay. Let's see if I do this right. Oh, 
Okay, yeah, hi. Um, so I always have little notes because otherwise I just go right off the rails and it's gonna be a half an hour and nobody wants that. Um, so I both research and write about AIDS and of course teach about it as well. And my research and writing, uh, I am looking at HIV AIDS in Utah. So Emma and I <laughs> know each other through that. Um, and I do write about the Utah AIDS Foundation as well as other aspects of the epidemic here. Um, we have an oral history project, uh, which is housed at the Marriott Library and an archive. So if people are interested in uh, just reading or using it for classes, all of those materials are available at the Marriott Library and you can access them there. Um, and if you have trouble accessing them, which is sometimes a thing, uh, you just grab me off the history department website. Um, so we have an oral history project, we have an archival collection. We actually did a documentary film named Quiet Heroes, which premiered at Sundance and won an Emmy, uh, which is a, a sort of an overview of the history of HIV AIDS in Utah, focusing particularly on the medical people, but also some of the community people and the UAF who responded to the epidemic. It also isn't as grim as it sounds. It actually has an adorable middle-aged lesbian love affair in the middle of it, so it's a little bit more fun that way than your average AIDS documentary. Um, <laughs> and that streams on Amazon if you want to check that out, although the library also owns it. Um, and so, and, and then there's a book, right, which is pretty close to being done. And the book looks at HIV AIDS in Utah, in part because it's AIDS in a conservative place, which is not something that we have uh, in the historical, like people are not writing about AIDS in conservative, it's all about New York and San Francisco. Um, we also, I also focus on caregiving because most of the academic work on HIV AIDS is either about politics or medicine or both. And I really wanted to look at what it meant when AIDS came to people's communities, to their congregations, to their families. And I wanted to sort of say, what was it like to actually confront HIV AIDS in general, in, in these smaller, more intimate spaces rather than in political or medical spaces. Um, the epidemic in Utah was largely an epidemic of uh, white men who had sex with men, although people of color were and still are, I assume, overrepresented in, uh, uh, with, uh, with people of, uh, who have HIV relative to their proportion in the population, um, which is true across the country as well. Um, and I think it, it, Utah's epidemic was as white as it was because Utah was as white as it was at the time. Um, so my, my work, in part because of the demographics of Utah, focuses on the impact of AIDS and the stigma of queerness. And I argue that AIDS began actually the hard process of destigmatizing queerness in the United States. Before AIDS, straight people saw queers as a danger to family, right? Pedophiles, you know, attacking marriage, all that kind of stuff. And um, what HIV does is it brings straight people and gay people together in joint caregiving. So caregiving for people with AIDS, particularly at end stage HIV, is enormously labor intensive. HIV in many ways is obviously about death, but it's also about disability and illness. And disability is hard, and it's hard to care for, and it takes time to support people. Um, and what happened was that queer people um, were doing this work with straight people, and straight people began to realize that A, they had queer people in their families, and B, that queer people were capable of family work, that they did that kind of work. And so I argue that uh, it really, it was HIV AIDS and the lesbian baby broom that brought us gay marriage, right? That it is AIDS that really opened up the possibility in the minds of straight people that marriage actually between gay people began to make sense for them or between queer people uh, in a way that it really did not before HIV came. Um, and it, marriage also was, you know, it also, became HIV AIDS and the lesbian baby boom, which both emerged in the 1980s and you know, then went through the 1990s and of course are still with us today, um, also changed the trajectory of the queer civil rights movement in the United States um, away from liberation, which I think many of us grieve over, right? We would rather be talking about liberation to a certain extent than things like marriage, which feel very assimilationist. Um, but marriage was the cheapest and fastest way to get legal rights, such as inheritance, health insurance, um, medical decision making, uh, all the things that you really need on the edges of life, on, with birth and with death. So AIDS made it clear that we needed those protections and we needed them now. Um, and so 
And what AIDS does is it both forces the queer community to focus on family rights in a way that they had not done in the 1970s, and it also makes straight people realize that family rights for queer people actually make sense. Um, I also remember AIDS vividly as a, like an early, late adolescent, early 20-something. I was in college in New York City uh, from 1986 to 1990, which was really kind of ground zero for AIDS in the United States at the time. Um, I was on the periphery of AIDS coalition to unleash power or act up. Um, and this was back before there were effective medications for HIV, and it felt like people were dying everywhere, on the streets, right? I mean, we had homeless people with HIV, which we probably still do, but in New York, on the streets in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, and art intersected with my understanding of AIDS through the graphics that ACT UP created for its actions, but also to raise awareness. Um, and what was really interesting, and we found out later through a lot of the, although I'm sure Virginia knows this, um, that a lot of the people who worked in the art collectives around HIV AIDS for ACT UP, so Grand Fury in particular, not only were artists, but also their day job was often marketing and advertising because you know, there aren't actually a lot of jobs for arts. It's very hard to make a living just as an artist, um, which was amazing and I think really impacted in positive ways their, um, their artwork for ACT UP because they knew how to sell things. And so what they were selling in this case was facts about AIDS, ACT UP's analysis of the problem of AIDS, ACT UP's solution to the problem of AIDS. Like, what are we going to do? Um, and so I, I, I strongly suggest that you just Google ACT UP imagery and check it out, because their work is so fascinating and fun and interesting. Um, and their message, in many ways, was about reforming how we do healthcare in the United States. So ACT UP demands um, universal healthcare, which of course we still don't have, uh, but also how we uh, set research priorities, how we develop and test medicine. But also, it had a very strong focus and sometimes a divisive focus on racism, sexism, homophobia, and the problems of poverty and social class and how they impact healthcare in the United States. Um, and like the videos that we saw today, much of ACT UP was uh, also invited collaboration against uh, uh, across lines of identity, right? So the videos today were from all over the world and people experiencing HIV infection all over the world. Um, and asking not just for allies, but also for accomplices in the work of defeating AIDS. And what I see in these films, um, and particularly in that last film, um, uh, the one that was in Portuguese and was about uh, children born with AIDS, um, was an anger, right? ACT UP was m motivated almost entirely by anger. Its emotional habitus was anger and rage. Um, and <laughs> the most direct way, uh, or that film to me, was mostly about anger at the pharmaceutical companies who have profited off of AIDS but has not, have not stopped it. Um, and anger at the governments who encouraged pharmaceutical companies to make money off of these things rather than to actually end them. Uh, and uh, and I, I really appreciated that, that that piece had that anger in it. And uh, that anger combined with grief, which is, again, that feeling that AIDS was for most of us in the 80s and 90s, um, was a feeling of grief that then motivated anger. Um, and I, um, so, and just to give you something to be angry about, um, in the United States, uh, a queer black man has a 50% chance of contracting HIV in his lifetime. For Latinx men, that is 25%, and for white men, it's 11%. Um, so AIDS has sort of run in the channels of racism and sexism and homophobia and class bias that have, were already carved in the United States, and it encompasses all of those stories. We could end AIDS. We have the medication. We have the money. We just haven't made the commitment because as a, a nation, we do not value the lives of people who have AIDS now, either here or around the world. Um, because the issue really isn't AIDS and HIV. The issue of AIDS is an issue of stigma. Um, it is racism, it is sexism, it is homophobia, it is poverty that are continuing this epidemic that we could end if we wanted to. Um, and so until we decide to end those plagues, we are not going to end AIDS. Thank you. You won an Emmy. <laughs> we did, I thought, right? Hi, family. My name is Saquon Colvis, and I am 
uh, a founding partner and executive director of a local nonprofit called Hope on Tap. And TAP stands for Testing, Treatment, and Peer-Led Prevention. Um, I am a woman living with HIV, and it's been almost 11 years now. Um, and stigma, exactly. Uh, I think the self-stigma is just as great sometimes as the outward stigma. Um, I didn't tell my family for the first five years that I had it because of that, that self-stigmatization. Um, I was also an injection drug user at the time, so it's just all, all the stuff and things, all the shame of everything, right? Um, I have a prison record, now, you know, I'm a closet IV user, now I have this diagnosis. Great. So I got into my recovery uh, four and a half years ago, wrapped my mind around my diagnosis, and noticed the differences in healthcare from people who use drugs and people who don't use drugs. And that's one of my main advocacy issues is drug user health is a thing. And really drug user health is, needs to be priority because we, I don't wanna say the sickest, but um, because of where we're at in life, we kind of need a little bit more attention because we're, you know, uh, this is gonna sound horrible, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, we are spreading diseases a little bit quicker like hepatitis C, uh, I specialize in testing for hepatitis C and HIV, and 70% of new cases in Utah of hepatitis C are injection drug users. So that's what I do, and we test all the way from Ogden down to St. George. Um, peer advocate, uh, just, I'm screaming from the mountaintops that people who have HIV are people. And I love the pieces by the end, you know, by the end of the short films, I was crying because I relate to that. Um, it also makes me appreciate my health as much as I do because sometimes we forget, you know, it's been 42, 43 years almost um, of the HIV and AIDS epidemic. And back in the 80s, that's how people found out they were in the stage of having AIDS. So um, to see advances in medicine, but drug companies are money makers. You know, why do we have vaccines for hepatitis A and B, but not C, and C is more prevalent? Um, there are vaccine trials going on now for HIV. It's been 40 plus years, and we're just now getting around to vaccine trials, really? Well, they, they didn't before, but they failed. <laughs> so the medications are, amazing, I'm undetectable, which means it is impossible to transmit the virus, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, we have laws on the books in Utah. Utah's a non-disclosure state, and we don't wanna talk about HIV because we have taken the person out of the disease. Um, we're so worried about, well, how did they get it? It doesn't matter, I'm a person with disease. Just like cancer, you don't ask, oh, how did you get that? Oh, it's a person with cancer. So I think we are too worried about things that don't really matter. And we stopped looking at the disease. We look more at behavior surrounding it. So cancer has kind of been heroicized, like, oh, they beat cancer, they're a champion. I think everybody should be on the same scope. Like, it's a person with HIV, it's a person with cancer, it's a person with, you know, uh, multiple sclerosis. It's, it's a person with a disease, a person that is hurting, that needs help, period. So, that's my take on that. And man, basically all of the things that I was hoping to talk about have come up already, and so I had to choose which one to start with. Um, and I think that it's important to remember that one of visual AIDS' sort of ongoing missions is to emphasize that AIDS is not over, mm -hmm. right? That the AIDS crisis has not ended, that while it might not seem quite so epidemic on a national scale in the U.S. among certain populations, that is only certain populations and only in the U.S. Um, and so I think that, you know, with what you all, all, all three of you spoke to. 
speaks to that. And I guess for, for starters, we've gotten to this a little bit, but I'd love to hear some more just about sort of people's thoughts about the video program, what, what themes stood out to you, and maybe particular themes that stood out in relationship to the work that you do. Yeah, um, I think the main, for me and, and Virginia, I think one of your kind of questions was, what is health? And I think the main theme across all the videos was everyone's focus on a different aspect of health. I think there was a mental aspect, there was a physical aspect, there was a spiritual aspect to it. And so that was really striking. Um, and it also highlights how everyone, you know, who is living with HIV has such different unique situations, right? And a different barriers, different battles that they're coming with. How that really feels like that applies to UAF is, is for us, and like Saquon mentioned, is is, you know, we know our healthcare system is not working um, and we just keep repeating the same thing. And so for UAF, it was pausing and saying, how are we switching that system, right? How are we switching that system to to of uh, the most kind of, and I hate using the term vulnerable because it takes away the power of these communities, but the most negatively impacted by negative health outcomes so people living with HIV and the LGBT community. And so we have these massive systems that don't work for them, right? And it's because we're trying to do one thing and one approach to the healthcare, which is really largely founded um, in, in pharmaceuticals and, and politics. And so for our work specifically, um, it was about stepping back and, and like, Saquon mentioned of, of looking at an individual person and understanding how you could help that person with their definition of health, whether what that's important. You know, some people might need mental health first before they start looking at their, their physical health. They might need social connections and that spiritual or uh, kind of emotional connection before they can work on mental health or even physical health. And so for us was how do we make a system that is easy because you know i i feel like all of us can say we've we're pretty used to uh looking into the medical system and accessing the medical system and it is still incredibly hard and i say this from a privileged place of being like there are times where i don't know how to do this and so for us it's the goal of how do we make this um as much of a one-stop shop as possible. Um, our goal is not to duplicate efforts and to really rely on partners um, to kind of elevate everyone's work because everyone's doing so many different things. And so our goal is to make sure we're, we're making sure people don't get lost in the confusion, in the chaos of, of this, you know, frankly, terrible system that we've created. Beth mentioned this of, of it's interesting that in, in Utah, you know, we don't have that historical context of HIV and people don't necessarily think of Salt Lake City or Utah when you're thinking of HIV. And it's almost the same when we're talking about health, um, when we're looking at kind of resources or networks of support within those communities, it's, it's very similar. So that's our role. Um, and I think what really resonated um, with the short films of kind of how we fit into it and what our work hopes to to really achieve. So I I really enjoyed the films as well, and I th I think one of the things that we we need to remember both about AIDS in general and particularly AIDS in Utah is again this issue of stigma. Um, and, and the difficulty that people have in seeing past stigma uh, to extend compassion and care for people, um, and how HIV has interacted with different stigmas at different times, right? So early on in HIV, the stigma was very much about queerness, um, and then, and it, and it continues to be that as well, as, you know, especially here in some ways, um, just because queerness is still so stigmatized here in ways that it really is not in a lot of other places. Um, and the difficulties that that creates, right, so that the stigma of same-sex attraction is likely to make you act in ways that put you at risk, which means that you are then at risk for HIV, which means that you might then have a second stigma of HIV itself, right? So then you're queer and you have HIV. Um, I know, insanity. 
And I remember asking Stan Penfold, who ran the UAF for a long time uh, before Emmer took it over, um, whether he thought that the stigma of HIV in Utah was better or worse than it used to be. And he actually said he thought it was worse because most people know that you can prevent HIV transmission. And so the, the stigma then becomes, well, you should have known better, right? And you should have acted better. Um, and that's very strong in the local culture, right? To, to project perfection, to project as if you know everything and you are on your way to righteousness and, and to exaltation. And that leaves so many of us behind because of course none of us are perfect and none of us are making always the best choices. It's just that sometimes those consequences are terrible and sometimes we're able to, to make it through those consequences. And I, I do remember when protease inhibitors, which are the medication that can be very, very effective for HIV infection and allows people to be undetectable and therefore both be healthy themselves and then also not transmit HIV, I do remember thinking I wasn't working in HIV anymore. I was in grad school, and I was so relieved because I had friends who would benefit from, from and did benefit from the meds. Um, but I also remember thinking, oh no, oh, oh, white, white middle class queer people are going to abandon AIDS, and AIDS is going to become just a disease of poverty and of race and of disadvantage. And I was not wrong about that. That has happened. Um, and so, that is another thing I really liked about the films, was just the diversity of people talking about AIDS and talking about those complications. Um, and But also, unfortunately, the way that that stigma has, has shifted, right? So that it is still a stigma of queerness in some places, but it also is interacting with all of these other issues of access to healthcare, like, you know, for a long, long time, in, you know, from 2010, I, I looked it up today and it doesn't seem to be true anymore, but in the, in the mid-teens, uh, seven out of the nine top states for new infections of HIV were all in the old Confederacy, right, in the South that, that seceded from the Union because they wanted to keep slavery. And the reason for that is because they wouldn't expand Medicaid under Obamacare, right? So people didn't have access in those states or here, right, to Medicaid. Um, because the states didn't want those people to have health insurance, I think, right? Like, I, I really do think that that's what it was. It was a bias, especially in the South, it's a bias of race, but it's also a bias against poor people. Um, and this idea that poor people are poor because they're lazy and that they could, they could just not be poor somehow, rather than that poverty is a structural product of capitalism. Well, and also in ways that are entirely racialized. And ways well. that are absolutely, yes, entirely racialized. And so that, that sort of, you know, I, I liked the diversity of these films. I thought they were interesting. They came from a bunch of different perspectives. I really also appreciated the ways in which they address the fact that AIDS is not gone, which again, people think it is, but it's not. And what's so infuriating is that it could be, right? That if we wanted to deal with the stigmas that, it, that cause HIV, we could. We just are not committed to doing that, that we still prefer to rank people by class and by race and by gender and sexuality. Um, so, stop there. Rant, rant paused. <laughs> Continue. <clears throat> Um, it's almost like the, the homeless crisis going on right now. People who are unsheltered, the police, I mean, this is total side tangent, but the police are coming to their camps and making them take down their tents and their tarps, put out their fires, um, when it's freezing conditions outside, because, in my opinion, it's almost like they want them to freeze to death, because then the problem just takes care of itself. Um, that's what the South reminds me of. Yeah. Um, Utah sees about 125 new cases of HIV a year. Last year, our numbers went up and disproportionately affected communities of color, um, Latinx, Native, and African American. So it's definitely not gone. Um, unfortunately, we are one of those states that is kind of stuck in the 80s. Uh, I teach. Um, HIV, hepatitis C, and STI awareness and prevention workshops, and some of the questions I get blow my mind. Um, I had a guy come up to me after, and he goes, you can really get HIV from having sex, are you serious? <laughs> yeah, you can. What? <laughs> what raw 
rock have you been living under? Well, I thought you only could get it from blood transfusions. I just, you know, from that little kid. That's how he learned about it. He saw a documentary on Ryan White, so he thought it was strictly blood transfusions. It was mind-blowing. <clears throat> and then I had another girl, um, this is a couple years ago, come up, and she was rather angry. She's like, I know you're lying to us. You can't, you can't have HIV. You're a girl. Oh, my gosh. So if I was going to lie about something, I definitely wouldn't glamorize having HIV. <laughs> but um, the films do bring up the fact that HIV and AIDS are very still much a thing. Um, and the intersectionality with COVID, I think, is interesting because when COVID first hit, it was, oh, mandatory lockdowns and face masks and everybody knew about it. Kind of like the gay cancer in the 80s. Oh my gosh, stay away from, you know, all the, all the stigmatizing and horrible things that were said. But now it's like COVID and nobody really talks about it. Nobody really wears face masks. It's not, but it's still there and people are still dying from it. I feel the same about HIV. Um, nobody really talks about it anymore. It's like, oh, HIV, mm, yeah, well, not in my town. Um, I do want to send a shout out to Puerto Rico <clears throat> because um, Dr. Novello uh, is an HIV AIDS doctor in Puerto Rico who has successfully eliminated perinatal HIV and AIDS. Um, I can't remember how, I think it's been almost 10 years. Has it been 10 years? I'm asking you like you know. I'm the historian. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah. years, I believe it's been it's 10 years story. that um, there has not been one case of a child born with HIV and AIDS to an HIV positive mother. So um, shout out to her. I think that's amazing. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's still a struggle. It's still a fight. And I would really like to see commercials on TV. <coughs> so you see the the Saint, Saint, you know, Saint Jude's Children's Research Hospital for kids with cancer, right? Sorry to keep bringing up cancer, it's just the first thing on my mind. Um, I want to see a Saint whoever's Children's Research Hospital for children with AIDS, but you don't because we don't want to talk about that. Um, it doesn't matter how someone acquired it. Like I said before, they need help dealing with it. So I was actually asked very early, I think it was my first year after being diagnosed, um, I made the mistake of telling someone I obviously shouldn't have, and they looked at me, they're like, well, you only get HIV if you're a whore or a junkie, so which one are you? Mm. I'm like, well, I actually got it from a monogamous relationship, thank you. Well, monogamous on my end, anyway. Yeah. Um, and that's always a problem. Yeah. but. The stigma is the biggest thing we need to fight with it. Uh, and Utah is still a lot of good old boy counties. Um, that's the fight that we're up against here. So, thank you. Um, my favorite, least favorite, mind-blowing student response <laughs> was, so in teaching like the Grand Fury, uh, Kissing Doesn't Kill, um, and the read my lips, kiss-ins, and things like that. And um, sort of offhandedly, presumably, everyone would know that it was a sign of the state of disinformation and lack of information that people thought that you could contract HIV from, you know, touching a doorknob after someone mm -hmm. who had seroconverted or sitting on a toilet or something like that. And at a previous institution, I had a student say, wait, you can't. So, I mean, uh, the more examples of it's the ongoing state. Um, of what seems to me what's coming up in what folks are talking about here, but I think also coming up in the films, is that there's kind of a long-term, both historical and also generational impact mm -hmm. of stigma. And there is a way, I don't know if it came up for other folks, and just sort of in the interest of size, I think that maybe we can kind of keep on with our questions, but open up the conversation to everyone. And so if folks have thoughts and want to weigh in, please feel free. Um, I won't make you all move up to the front of the room so we can hear you, but know in my heart that's what I want. Um, but the way in which it seemed like stigma and trauma sort of like had echoes with each other in, in these. And I would just wonder if, if folks had thoughts about that or how you see that um, sort of ramifying in terms of the medical practices that you're trying to engage with. 
Yeah, so kind of similar to how Saquon mentioned, one thing we saw in terms of trauma from the epidemic um, when COVID hit is a lot of um, our clients who had been impacted um, immediately kind of connected the COVID pandemic to the early epidemic of HIV. Um, and so that was an interesting um, kind of mindset in navigating that in medical space where we are actively giving people medical case management and trying to get them to engage in care um, and engage in mental health services. Um, so that was like the main thing. It's interesting with, with that is, um, like Saquon said, is, is you, you saw similar but not to the same extent. Um, I think that's what highlighted for a lot of people of um, when it impacts everyone now, look how people respond, how mm -hmm. quick the response is, how much money is put into the response. And so it highlights the stigma and also exemplifies the trauma, right? Just even the experience is very much similar to how people experience that, that time. Um, and so navigating that was difficult, I think, the one thing that we don't necessarily talk about in terms of HIV um, is how much HIV prepared us for the COVID response. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of colleagues and a lot of the researchers were pulled from HIV to then do COVID. And you know, uh, Dr. Fauci is, is one of those, those people, but um, there was a lot of expertise. And even within um, the community, a lot of people had to kind of jump from HIV and sexual health to then lend itself to COVID. So things like contact tracing within COVID, um, again, like Saquon said, is unfortunately very focused on how did you get HIV? Um, but in terms of COVID early response, that's what they also did was contact tracing. Um, and look at that from uh, actually all of the trainings and stuff are from the model of HIV. Um, so it's interesting how that you know, there's that balance of, of, you know, in more recent years, how it kind of keeps going. And the trauma, I think, from it, I, it's not it's not something that goes away, right? I think it's something that can constantly be, you know, sparked. And I think we're seeing that um, more and more now with things coming up. I actually, I don't know if you guys had this experience, but when COVID first broke and everything shut down, I was resentful. I was just like, nothing shut down for AIDS. You people didn't stop anything. And it was, it was so interesting because I was sort of in the middle of it to the degree that like one is as an undergrad, really. But like New York City really was in terrible shape from 1986 to 1990 when it came to HIV AIDS. And you know, people were homeless and dying of AIDS on the streets and on the subways. You could see it. Uh, because end stage HIV, especially if you have Kaposi sarcoma, is written on the body. You can see it. Um, and I remember when COVID hit, I was like, oh my God, they're shutting everything down. They never shut anything down for us. And, and living in the 80s and 90s with HIV, it was really interesting, like just around HIV, it was very interesting. It, it felt so isolating because so many people didn't know anything about it, didn't care about it. Anything that they did know about it was stigma and nothing shut down. It was just like, those people over there are gonna die and they deserve it and that's where we are, right? And, and so that, that was an interesting interaction for me, it was just my own feelings of anger around like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll be shut down in my house, but like, why didn't they shut anything down for us? Um, and they're still not shutting it down, right? And they're still not putting the resources into it that they should. And I, I found that inter very entertaining. Um, I also, there was a really good piece for Vox, like, I don't know, maybe three or four weeks into the shutdown that was written by a journalist who was a lover of a man whose papers I was using in my own research uh, in San Francisco. And um, at the very end of the piece, he did a very early COVID HIV comparison. And number one on the list was the government will not save you. Um, and I just remember thinking, true, right, that we need to save ourselves. Um, and I, I think, uh, when I think about also trauma and HIV, for me, so much of it is around not just the trauma of HIV itself and, and what it was like for that generation, and it wasn't just one generation, but, but particularly one generation of gay men were hit so hard, right, because it's circulating in the 70s, but they don't know, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, by 1983, 
50% of gay men in San Francisco were HIV positive. Like we had the data, you know, and knew that that was basically true. Um, and so there was this generation of mass death, which is one of the reasons why I like the title of the series, Everybody I Know is Sick. And I kept messing up in my notes when I was writing about it uh, because I kept writing everyone I know is dead, um, which is another thing that that generation experienced. Um, but there's also the trauma itself and stigma from, and trauma from stigma is what is accelerating the HIV epidemic, right? It is the fact that people are made to feel that their queerness or their drug use or their poverty is somehow their fault and therefore they are not worth saving. Um, and, and that is just a dynamic that was in HIV from the beginning and is still in HIV. And, it, and that is what we need to end. And that's, I think, part of why I found the piece um, from the Philippines, or sort of based around the bed. Yeah. And the sort of the, um, like, the housedness, given the history of homelessness yes. in terms of disproportionate impact of people who are contracting HIV, but also the extent to which you could entirely legally be kicked out of your housing. Yeah. Um, without any recourse. Um, and so then... Um, I, think, I feel like there's a conversation, maybe we can get to it, or maybe there's too many amazing things to talk about with, with this program, but about care, yeah. right? And about sort of like alternative systems of care that develop precisely because of the lack of government response um, and the lack of knowledge for the conventional you know, medical system to be able to help take care of people um, and how that maybe continues um, to impact how we think about, about health and care and things like that today. So, so I don't know if you have uh, experience with that in the work that you're doing now that is doing so much of this work, or other thoughts. Yes, actually I do. <laughs> Amazing. Um, <laughs> along in terms of trauma, uh, people living with HIV are actually 20 times more likely to experience trauma than the general population. Uh, and I believe that to be absolutely true, just from you know, personal experiences um, living with HIV for almost 11 years. Um, I do want to say, before I forget, thank you guys for, for doing this. Um, because, because of the stigma and the self-stigma, a lot of people living with HIV, you know, can't feel that they can disclose their, their status. So art is a way for them to express themselves in ways that they wouldn't be comfortable doing otherwise. So I just want to thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you all for attending. Um, I think this is really cool. But uh, as far as medical establishments failing our priority populations, yes. Um, I actually just found two clients who are both HIV positive. They're living in a tent, uh, kind of sort of by the Jordan River on North Temple, um, who have been out of care for years because they obviously, they're unsheltered. They don't have transportation. Um, she has a lot of health issues, so it's hard for her to make her way to the tracks, take it up to the university, because we only have one, well now two. Two. But before, we only had one specialty HIV clinic in the state of Utah. Um, so to make her way up there and be there on time is extremely difficult. Both of them are still actively using, and I don't know if anybody in the room is a user or not, but we really don't like to be on time for things. It's hard. So, unfortunately, there's a rule. If you're 15 minutes late to your appointment, they won't see you. You have to reschedule, which is really hard for my population because if we show up, even if it's an hour late, we're there, please. I think some exceptions need to be made. Um, so that's, that's where my work comes in. We actually provide client transportation. Mm -hmm. So I've scheduled them appointments. Um, I'm going to be picking them up and taking them up there myself uh, to get them the care that they need because they've been out of care for two or three years now. Um, but it's finding those people that the medical establishments have overlooked or forgotten or you're late, don't come back being an advocate for them and, and raising my voice and saying, this is part of my French, this is bullshit. 
Just because I'm late doesn't mean I don't deserve equal access to healthcare. Are you kidding me? Um, so yeah, don't get me started because I get riled up, girl. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, I do see it all the time in my work. That's that's actually really interesting because and uh, very disappointing because yes. Dr. Reese, who is the, we only had one doctor in the state for ten years covering this, and she partnered with Holy Cross Hospital, mm -hmm. um, which was still run by the Sisters of the Holy Cross, right? And one of the things that I learned in writing about this and in interviewing Dr. Reese is, is to just really question the priorities of medicine and why we have it set up the way that we do. And one of the, so Reese, before she was here, because she's not local, um, she was working on the Rosebud Reservation uh, as a director of an Indian health clinic. And she talked about how that taught her a bunch of things, one, one of which was if somebody makes it to the clinic, mm -hmm. you need to see them. Thank you. Because on the reservation, people have huge issues with transportation. It is a large Western reservation. It is very difficult. Um, people are very poor, so they often don't have their own access to transportation. Mm -hmm. And that working there really taught her that medicine is organized around the status of the doctors. And, the, and basically, it's a very status-oriented system in which the, the idea is the people with the most status, their time is the most valuable. Mm. And it is not actually organized around the patient at all. And of course, y'all know this, right? Because y'all have, a, you know, you have accessed care in the United States, and you know that it's not, you, your doctor can leave you sitting there for 20 minutes, half hour, 45 minutes. You don't get to complain about that because right. they're just behind, right? But you don't get to be late for an appointment. Um, and so one of the things I loved about Dr. Reese was that it used to be that not only did Dr. Reese run behind because she spent time with people and explained to people what, you know, what they needed to understand and gave them that time, um, and it used to be that the patients would call uh, when they knew they had an appointment and they would say, how late is she today? <laughs> right? And then whoever was running the, you know, the, whoever was the receptionist would be like, she's about an hour and a half behind right now. Right, and so then how do you time showing up because you know you want to be seen, but also you know she's running an hour and a half behind. Um, but it's very disappointing that that is now the policy of the clinic. And Reese didn't work at the U because the U didn't want to do HIV. And so she was at Holy Cross because Holy Cross, first of all, she had admitting privileges there before HIV broke. Um, but then the Sisters of the Holy Cross have a mission to stand with the poor and the powerless. It's literally in the mission of their order. And so they took on AIDS, partially because Reese was a doctor of theirs, but partially because they literally saw HIV AIDS as, in, as, as congruent as working with their mission as women religious in the United States. Um, and so yeah, it, back, back when Holy Cross was there, you did not have to be on time for your appointment. They would see you. Um, and then Holy Cross was sold, speaking of healthcare in the United States, uh, because there just aren't that many nuns anymore and because HIV was expensive. And so the order of Holy Cross started selling off its less profitable hospitals. Mm -hmm. And our hospital was one of those. And Reese had to go to the U. Right? So Dr. Reese took her, she put on her little lesbian superhero cape, and she carried her 450 clients up to the U within wow. three months of Holy Cross closing. Or Holy Cross being sold. Oh, by the way, also, the people who bought it was for-profit. And uh, it was a for-profit health chain. And while they were in the process of negotiating the sale, they promised that they would continue their charity care. They promised that Reese and her patients could stay. And as soon as they got control of the hospital, they told her they did not want her kind of patients. And they told her to take her practice elsewhere. And so then she had a good relationship with the people up at the U, and she became... She basically moved everybody up to the U. Um, but there was a huge cultural conflict around how to man, like moving from a private practice where you really did get to run things however you wanted to a university hospital was, you know, university, like academic hospitals are not patient centered, right? Um, and so the, I, I write a little bit about that conflict and just how difficult it was for Dr. Reese and Maggie, who was her PA, mm -hmm to adjust to and also begin to sand the edges off of the way that academic medicine is about academics and about status and is not actually about patients and what patients need. 
Well, it's hard because I think I always push back on my team is what makes us different. In some some instances, it's I will be like, you know, you are. We need to look at us on par with the U and IHC and all of these others. And then I always come back with the caveat of what makes us different. So I think one of the first eye-opening conversations about care and changing care was we sat down with our our provider and we said, well, well, how many patients per day is standard? And they said, well to keep me comfortable and sane 10, um, I'm used to doing 15 to 20 because I had to meet certain performance metrics for the hospital. So um, obviously we are a nonprofit, uh, a nonprofit and so for us it was able to be able to look at, at that of uh, like, okay, so we're not shooting for the 15 to 20, we're shooting for the comfortable care we're also like very careful of who's on our team, which we have a luxury of of being able to do that. Where, like, we have providers who will be who can tell the scheduler of this person is going to show up, but they will show up forty minutes late. So push back that appointment slot, pad my time in between, um, and so I think that's where, you know, again, I think in traditional medical systems, which was largely what we're used to, it, it doesn't work. And we're, this is how we're letting people just fall through the cracks and we know it doesn't work. Um, and so that's really what, you have to leave room for pivoting in this. And of course, you know, obviously everyone has to keep do doors open and there, you know, are certain things to do, but there's little differences that you can make that are not a huge burden on the system. I'm going to be bringing you a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and an hour and a half late, that's my kind of doctor. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I have so many things that I want to keep following up on, but I also want to do my job. And what? it <laughs> definitely leaves space for if there are folks in the audience. Derek, it looks like you maybe are wandering with a microphone. Is that what's happening? Excellent. So if, yeah, if folks have um, thoughts, if you have questions, um, or again, like I mentioned earlier, if you just want to kind of pop in in the conversation that we're having, please pop in. Yeah. I can be really loud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. So I worked for the state in, in Utah for, for quite a bit of time, and um, I'll be honest, my goal was to go in and see more of me represented in government, both at the local and the federal level, um, to be able to say, you know, this is someone who's a person of color, who is gay, who represent, knows the community, that this is disproportionately impacting, and can make a difference, right? And I very quickly learned that I couldn't make that difference um, at, at the, the state, very frankly. Um, and every corner I turned was just kind of shutting that down. And so without, for me, it was trying to find the little wins that I could do. And so little things like, and this sounds what was writing contracts to make them more like accessible. Right, so we have to find this really rigid way of doing this. How do I interpret this federal guideline 
that they're not giving the interpretation on in a more open and inclusive way and then put that into my contract so that this community organization who has more strength and power in terms of what they can do in their reach is able to do that. So for me, it was finding those small wins of like, what is, what can I do tangibly? And then also understanding that like, I think there was so much burden of like, I need to exist in this space and I need to like change it and I need to change it. Um, but for me, it was also understanding when I needed to leave and find an opportunity if I felt capable and willing to go and, and amplify my voice of finding a different platform to do that. So I think it is it is really that of understanding yourself very in depth and knowing of if you are, and I, I know many people at the state who are super committed to working there and doing good work and it works really well for them and they continue to do what, you know, those small wins every day. But I think that's that was the biggest thing for me. And then I think that eventually when you like understand, for me personally, I can say it was understanding of like, I've done what I can and I want to do more, right? Like this is not enough, um, you know, and I, I'm sure Beth and Sequoia have more. Um, so on a, a grand level, um, getting involved in trying to change the legislation, uh, Utah state laws, <clears throat> like I said before, are very stigmatizing and not based around the science of transmission. Um, so that is one of my next feats is uh, trying to get those laws, I know not banished completely off the books because that's way too, way too progressive for Utah at the moment, um, but just trying to change the word and modernize the laws so they're not so stigmatizing. Um, but on a smaller scale, uh, normalizing the conversation, not only around HIV, but around sexual health. Mm -hmm. Because, like we all know, us in Utah, we don't have sex until we're married, and none of us do drugs. We don't. <laughs> Never. Never. So, normalizing the conversation around, yes, we do have sex outside of marriage. A lot of us do. And yes, a lot of us do drugs. So, um, not talking about sex is, like, what's your sexual risk? What's a risk reduction? Because talking about it in that sense, when you talk about it as a risk, risk means it's dangerous, which means it's not good. And if it makes me feel good, I don't want to talk about it as if it's a bad thing. So just trying to change the conversation and trying to change the, the conversation and the wording around sexual health and normalizing it. And understand that everybody be humping. <laughs> it's not something that we need to hide. So I think talking about it will also open up the door for prevention talk, so. Sorry, there's a health officer in Utah who has for decades now declined any funding for STIs because their county um, people don't have sex outside of marriage and they don't have STIs in their county. <clears throat> um, their county happens to be one of the top five counties for STI burden in the state, so. Yeah. Yep. Shocked. Yeah. Shocked. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that was that was an early response to HIV. Is that even on? Nope. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. Early on, right? We had epidemiologists in the state saying that HIV would not come here because we didn't have queer people here, <laughs> and that was a queer like it's just the level of ridiculousness of all of those statements put together was was pretty insane. One of the things that really bothers me about the whole Stan Penfold. HIV stigma is higher now with this idea that you should have known is we're an abstinence only state. How are people supposed to know? Hello. Right? We don't have fact based sex education here. So why are we blaming people for not understanding how to protect themselves or not understanding their risk? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what we can do, I mean, I agree uh, with everything that's been said. I, I also this, the forces that we're dealing with are so big that it feels very disempowering. And I think there are times, I agree with Emmer, that you need to take the small wins when you can, and you need to try to make a difference where you are when you can, and you need to preserve yourself if you feel like you're burning out, right? You need to, to pay attention to you, because you're not going to be any good to anybody if you burn out. Um, but I also think just something from teaching, like it's, it's a truism in teaching that you start where people are. 
And I, I think that one of the things we need to do is we need to have these conversations when they came, they come up, right? And we need to, not in an aggressive way, but in a gentle way, say, you know, well, I actually think differently about issue X, Y, Z, whatever that is, um, and and humanize the people around us and humanize the people in front of us. Um, I also think we need to work on our coalitions. I think. We need to work together to deal with the issues that we face together. Um, and there's always divisions between different communities because people are different and that's okay. And I think if we start from the position of people are different and that's okay, then we need to, then we can make more coalitions and we can get more done. Like this legislative session is gonna be a nightmare. Right, it is, it just is, and, I, and we're gonna need to show up, and we're gonna need to show up when they attack immigrants, and we're gonna need to show up when they're not providing services for the homeless, and we're gonna need to show up when they attack trans people, and we're gonna, you know, we need to, to do those things. And I think it also is very helpful to just understand that there's so much that we don't know about other people and other people's lives and also systems, right? So. You know, I'm a dyke. I, you know, I came out in the 80s. I didn't know a lot about trans folk, right? And I have learned an enormous amount in the last 15 years from my trans and non-binary students. And being open to being wrong, being open to not understanding something, but then saying, oh, I don't understand this. Maybe I should ask somebody who does, right? That, that is really helpful. And I know, I know that's not like a specific thing to do, um, but you know I'm a historian. I don't I don't do public policy, um, but but I mean it just it does feel like that's where we need to be. Um, is we actually first of all we do need to pay attention. Democracy is at risk here nationally, et cetera, and people are getting hurt, and and that's something that I just find so infuriating about politics in Utah is that so much of it appears to be like posturing. Right, and playing to the base as if nobody's being hurt by a ban on you know, trans health care for youth. Right? There are people being hurt. There are absolutely people being hurt. What's astonishing to me, and maybe this is also about stigma, is that they're hurting their own children. Right? Because queer folks, trans folks, we're scattered throughout the population. Everybody has them. Right? And so when I look at those politicians talking, railing, about the transgender movement or whatever, right? And this is my own obsession because there's all kinds of nonsense going down on campus. But th that I just, I'm like, we're, this isn't even about vilifying immigrants or vilifying African American people or whatever racism you've got going on. This is about vilifying your own children. Um, and, you know, there but for the grace of God go you when it comes to your kid or your grandkid or your coming out as queer, coming out as trans, needing help, needing help dealing with stigma that you yourself have built up. But again, that's just my rant. <laughs> but I mean really just trying to meet people where they are and to say, what can I learn from these people rather than what can I teach them? Can I add one thing? Go. You just made my whole night say, <laughs> I'm a dyke. <laughs> it is true. I just, I love that. <laughs> Um, one thing is, if you do meet someone living with HIV, don't say you're sorry. Uh, I've had a handful of people over the years be like, oh, I am so sorry about your AIDS. <laughs> well, I, I don't have AIDS, first of all, I'm <laughs> HIV positive, and second, there, you have nothing to be sorry for. Um, so yeah, if you meet someone and they disclose their status, don't be like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. Well, it has nothing to do with you. You don't have to be sorry about anything. Uh, so yeah, just normalizing HIV, you know, period, mm -hmm. really. It's something you can do. But I know that you don't, you're not like that anyway, Jasmine. Because <laughs> you're here. All right, so I'm gonna respect the last part of my job, which is getting you all out of here on time into bed at a reasonable hour. <laughs> but maybe this shows that we should like give more time to the Q&A next year. Mm -hmm. You're all gonna come back, right? Awesome. So let's uh, give a massive thank you to Mr. Thank you for giving us for letting us come to you. Thank you to the USA for putting on this program um, and staying up late themselves. Uh, thanks to you all for coming. Um, and definitely.
definitely, if you have friends who might be interested in the program, it's online and publicly available. Um, spread it around. Tell your friends. Keep the conversation going. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Get those people to their clinic. <laughs> Not on time. It's, it's so frustrating. Well, excuse me, well, one thing that we didn't get to talk to, but I think so a lot of what my work is about is the AIDS crisis is a crisis of meaning. Right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so, like, the production of meaning of what counts as health. 